I'd like to continue speaking today about sacrifice. And I failed to mention last time, so we're going to review real quick. What does this have to do with our lives as Christians? Why am I, why does the church, why do the saints make such a big deal about this? Well, the best way to do that, I think, is to look at it in light of the perspective that we've been looking at everything the last year or so, and that is the purpose of everything. So, to review then, and one day we'll get to the point where everyone says it nice and loud, but we're warming up still. Remember, the purpose of everything is union with God through in his mystical body, which is the church. Sorry. So, what does this have to do with union? What does sacrifice have to do with union? Does God need sacrifices? No. What the sacrifices, the penances, the mortifications that we do is to remove the obstacles to our union. We go to communion, we pray, we, we act out of charity to unite ourselves to be closer to God. We go to confession and make sacrifices to remove the obstacles of sin and selfishness and etc. that we experience that keeps us from following God like we should. So when it comes to sacrifices, there are there's two areas I want to talk about today. One is the two types of suffering that we can offer. The first is those which happen to us against our will that we have not chosen, and that's this life on earth. There are so many things that happen that we don't choose, whether it be as uh, simple and petty as the annoyances of getting behind a slow driver uh, to as dramatic as cancer. But there are things that happen that we don't have control over, which we should then offer as a sacrifice. The alternative, of course, is just whining and complaining about it, which gets us nowhere. The second type, though, are the things that we purposely do. And I want to turn and give just an example or two from the three children at Fatima, uh, Lucia, Jacinta, and Francisco, because they put all of us to shame, these children who are 12 and under. Lucia explains just one example, um, gives a little story here. She says, a little old woman gave me, Lucia, not only a pitcher of water, but also some bread, which I accepted gratefully. I ran to share it with my little companions and then offered the pitcher to Francisco and told him to take a drink. I don't want to, he replied. I want to suffer for the conversion of sinners. You have a drink, Jacinta, but I want to offer the sacrifice for sinners too. Then I poured the water into a hollow in the rock so that the sheep could drink it and went to return the pitcher to its owner. The heat was getting more and more intense. The shrill singing of the crickets and grasshoppers coupled with the croaking of the frogs in the neighboring pond made an uproar that was almost unbearable. Jacinta, frail as she was, and weakened still more by the lack of food and drink, said to me with that simplicity which was natural to her, tell the crickets and frogs to keep quiet, I have such a terrible headache. Then Francisco asked her, Don't you want to suffer this for sinners? The poor child, clasping her head between her two little hands, replied, Yes, I do. Let them sing. Another example of voluntary penance that these children did, uh, which Our Lady told them not to do while they were sleeping because it was harmful to them, was also the following. As we were walking along the road with our sheep, I, Lucia, found a piece of rope that had fallen on the cart. I picked it up, and just for fun, I tied it around my arm. Before long, I noticed that the rope was hurting me. Look, this hurts, I said to my cousins. We could tie it around our waist and offer the sacrifice to God. This is what our Lord means by becoming like children, as they accepted this the word from heaven that sacrificing, voluntary offering sacrifices was spiritually efficacious. So those are the areas that we can, the categories that we can offer. Now let's look at some of the areas in which we can mortify ourselves. This is going to contribute to your choosing your Lenten penances again. The first one, and possibly the least obvious, but the most powerful, is in the area of humility. The word mortification means putting to death, and it's our selfishness and our egocentrism that has to be killed without which we cannot be saved. Humility is submission to the truth, and there are two truths which we should never forget in the spiritual life. One, we cannot rely on our own strength, 
And two, we cannot do anything spiritually fruitful without the grace of God. And this is a mortification of our pride, our inordinate self-love. <clears throat> I'm just going to give one clarification on this to be clear. Why is this, how does this apply to other things? So, for example, someone who's arrogant about their ability in sports or music or whatever. How does these two truths apply? Well, the, the underlying truth, the underlying uh, thing that proud people, that is all of us, uh, forget is that when we actually are good at something, even if we're legitimately the best, number one, might we might say, that we have to always remember that we are relying on God to do this, and it's a God-given gift, talent, and strength. Another area that's very important is our devotion to our duties of state. Again, not obvious. You are going to become holier by going to work and providing for your family or cleaning the house than spending all day in the church. I mean, you should spend time in the church, and maybe more than you already are, but you cannot neglect your duties of state. Your homework is part of your, part of your spiritual life, as annoying as it is. Because one of the greatest dangers, uh, occasions of sin, is idleness. Now, that doesn't mean we have to be busybodies, but it does mean that we should fulfill our duties. The most common area that we think of, though, when it comes to penance, of course, is bodily penance, physical penance. What this boils down to is very simple. We have to be able to tell our bodies, no. This area is so important that I, I, can, I can say that most health problems are a result of misusing food and drink and the sexual faculty in ways that God did not intend. Doc, you can confirm or deny that later if you'd like. Um, in fact, a lot of most problems in families are rooted in the misuse of the sexual faculty. This ability to say no to ourselves in legitimate desires helps us say no in illegitimate desires. The, the image I like to use on this that helps you, uh, two images actually, one is of a car that's out of alignment. You know that if your car is listing to one side, it's not enough to keep the steering wheel going straight. You have to move it just a little bit in the other direction. That's what fasting does. We're all crooked because of sin. We're all tending to sin. And we have to compensate in the other direction just a little bit, making sacrifices, or a lot making sacrifices to compensate for that. Same thing with if you unfold a paper clip, for example. You know that to get it to straighten out, you have to go a little bit past straight so that it kind of goes back a little bit to the, the position you want it to be in. Remember that these are all subjective. So as you're thinking about this, it's helpful to get ideas from other people that they have, our penances have to address our particular needs, our particular weaknesses. So what form do these bodily penances take? Well, the most common, of course, is fasting. It's not just a mount of them, okay? It can be taking our time, it can be eating simpler, basic foods, not putting salsa on everything. Eating less, of course, but also not expecting our foods to be exactly what we want, or even better, purposely choosing our less favorite options when we have options. I gave the example uh, this morning, and I'll repeat it now, uh, even though he's not here. But I was very humbled by one of my servers a couple of weeks ago, because when I went to his place of employment, one of the little Mexican ladies there is always trying to back the father up. So I tell them how much I want, but then they go and look for like the biggest pieces and everything. They're like, no, I don't want the bigger pieces, I want the crispier pieces, right? And he just kind of chuckles and goes, that's gluttony. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that is. <laughs> so I stopped doing that. Um, but it's not just in quantity, it's also in getting what we want. Having it our way, as, as you might say. The other form of this bodily penance involves sacrificing comfort. Now, for, depending on the state of your body, you might feel that you can't do any more in that area, and that's fine. But there are little things that we can do, and especially when your bodies are still in good shape and your knees work and all that. You know, Some of the things that I suggest and I actually see people doing is instead of sitting you kneel, instead of kneeling on the knee there, you kneel on the floor. Little things like that. Uh, thermostat penances which I know sounds extremely hypocritical coming from me, but you have to have a caveat in there that if you can't pray with sweat trickling down your back, you might want to try it at other times or whatever, right? So those are the big ones, but there are a couple of other things which may uh, be uh, 
also necessary for you to consider uh, because they are common enough. I'm just going to run through these relatively quickly to, to wrap up. But we need to consider mortifying our vision even if what we're looking at is not necessarily sinful, is it really helpful? This involves reading as well, right? Our speech and our hearing. Now, an introvert may not feel that they talk too much, but they may possibly do so, and extroverts generally do talk too much. We say too many things, whether out loud or in writing, you know, on the internet or whatever. Our hearing needs to be mortified. The words that we use need to be holy, and they probably need to be a lot less. That's a good practice to look at for Lent. Similarly, our memory and our imagination need to be mortified. Dwelling on the past is not helpful. I know I've, I've preached about this once already briefly, um, and I'm not going to go into detail right now, but dwelling on things, injuries, fantasizing about back when your knees still worked, that kind of a thing, um, that's not helpful. That's not fruitful. So we need to mortify our memory and our imagination um, and think about those things which will uh, allow us to live in faith, hope, and charity, and not in the past or future that doesn't exist. And finally, of course, our curiosity. This one is extremely easy to fall into when most people have in their pocket a device which gives them access to all the information one could ever want from the world, including what your friend had for lunch. And very often, we do not need to know all of this. So, we need to mortify our curiosity and not always look up facts or events or things like that. We certainly don't want to have our head in the sand, but we want to make sure that what we are seeking to know is actually helpful and not just idle and a waste of time. So again, to prepare for Lent, as we get much closer to Lent, use this as discernment. Um, make sure that you make time to confess your sins and then to offer your personal sacrifices to show God how sorry you are to make up for your lack of love and the lack of love of other people, as I've said that. His love for us is greater than we can ever know. And there's no way that we can ever repay God for his love or what he has offered for us, but we should die trying.